the panel is going to be moderated by Meta Parlikar, who is the CEO of Casper Labs. You may have caught her earlier uh, doing a demo. Um, she has decades of experience delivering production software, but her uh, first formal involvement with blockchain came in 2017 when she served as the tech manager for the Archain project for 14 months before she co-founded the Casper Labs in the fall of 2018. So if the panel wants to come up, I know Meta will introduce everyone else and we'll get some mics handed out. Hey everyone, happy to be here again. And this panel is about FinTech and uh, decentralized finance more specifically. And I'm gonna let my panelists uh, introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Eric and I'm uh, from Ontology Network. Uh, I do the US ecosystem development so developer ecosystem in the US and US partnerships and Ontology is a public multi-chain blockchain project and distributed trust platform. We'll get into what that means throughout the panel. Hello, sorry, hey. Uh, hey all, my name is uh, Stani and I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Aave and one of the main products of Aave is, is um, Eatland, which is basically the first uh, decentralized uh, lending marketplace on, on Ethereum uh, based on smart contracts. And among that, we have also another product that is basically a uh, payment processors, payment processor where users can pay their bills with cryptocurrency. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm the director of Bumo Foundation, and I'm leading the North American business for Bumo. Uh, actually, Bumo is a, a blockchain infra infrastructure. We supported two different kind of blockchains. One is a permission chain. We have many real life use cases in like supply chain finance, uh, insurance, reinsurance, this kind of you know enterprise level applications. Uh, the second uh, blockchain we are supporting is some uh, public chains. Uh, we are using you know depots uh, and PBFT, this two-layer consensus algorithm, so uh, it's uh, with a high throughput. Yeah, it's happy to be here. Terrific, thank you for that. So I don't know a lot about decentralized finance, so my first question is for all of you, what is decentralized finance? So you take central, you take finance, which is like centralized right now, and you, uh, you decentralize it. <laughs> And then that makes it decentralized okay. finance. Okay, that's fair. I mean, <laughs> but like in, in a little bit more granularity, right? Okay. Like what is the implications for banks and like just higher level? So, so decentralized finance is, is the idea of like, okay, you think of blockchain as like a database uh, and you think how most companies right now that use a database, you know, when, when you come, when you choose your tech stack, you have your front end, you have... Uh, your middle end, and then when you come to your back end, it's like, what kind of database am I going to use to store all the uh, information uh, about my employees, my cu my customers, right? Like, if it's finance companies, like the balances and the transfers and the transactions, you would pick like a, a table or a MySQL or a NoSQL database. What decentralized finance is kind of doing is like, okay, let's use blockchain for that instead. Uh, so we kind of like we we open it, we open it up. It's kind of like open source. Finance, I think, is actually more accurate for a lot of what people are working on that is considered decentralized finance. You open it up so that other entities can integrate with it and work with it, and it kind of becomes more of like a, a collaborative network of financial products as opposed to uh, uh, individual centralized companies that have financial offerings. Yeah, good. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I could add basically to that. I mean, one of the key points is, is that... Uh, there is limitation on the counterparty risk. So basically you can make transactions with someone you don't know uh, because of the smart contracts. So, so kind of like because they're pre-programmed deployed code that are uh, resistant to changes. Uh, so, so that's, that's uh, one of the key concepts of uh, decentralized finance. And I mean, it's very difficult to define uh, uh, DeFi because like there's uh, different elements to it. For example, some, uh, some kind of like interpretations are that you you have to have the non-custodial uh, relationship with, with the uh, DeFi service provider or smart contract, and you have to store data in, in blockchain, and, and also, uh, I mean, transparency is 
one of the reasons. So I think it's very difficult to kind of like define like what is DeFi. And I think like there's different levels of DeFi. There are like non-custodial solutions and there are just solutions that are like completely on smart contracts and, and utilizing like the decentralized infrastructure uh, to the extent. And another perspective is also that we uh, see is that DeFi is a way where young kids like me can create financial products that normally bankers do. So it's a pretty cool concept in that way. Yeah, it is. And uh, actually, I think it's comparing with centralized. I, I totally agree with that. You know, for the centralized traditional finance, they're you know, centralized with low transparency. And also, you know, uh, it's within a closed system, right? So for DeFi, it's built on uh, distributed ledgers. Right, first, so it's uh, it's not that centralized to some extent, and also for the um, uh, transparency, the marketing level information can be transparent to all participants, while also it can preserve individual privacy, and for the uh, you know, they they are open sourced, so it means every party if they can they have the ability to. Uh, develop, they can be the part of this DeFi as well. DeFi system or DeFi products. And also it means it's accessible to everyone. Everyone can get this DeFi services, not like only some middle level or high you know, uh, billionaire, they can get this service. It's everyone can get access. Also, this DeFi, I think, is, is quite a broad concept is not only in the retailer side. I think for the small business, they also need this DeFi uh, platform or products. Yeah. So to kind of summarize my understanding from, thank you for all, for all that, by the way. To summarize, it sounds like there's a few things you get. You get, um, instead of being multiple closed systems that have these very long and complicated mechanisms, of transferring funds from one to the other, the wire system, the SWIFT system, by way of example, that take days in which to clear a transaction because nobody trusts one another. Um, you have a much more open um, system where everything just happens on the blockchain and these transactions can happen in a completely transparent way and then there isn't an issue of any closed systems having to communicate. And then uh, you also mentioned something interesting about the underbanked, right? Where there's people that don't have access to banking infrastructure today could potentially use uh, decentralized finance tools as a way to get access to digital currency, right? And, and, and use those um, monetary values as a way to, to enter into some form of a banking system. So thank you very much for that. So, you know, what are the key trends that you see shaping payments in the future? There's a lot of talk about payments, um, particularly around the Bitcoin network and, and cryptocurrency in general. What are the trends that you see that are really important in, in the direction that we're going with respects to payments? You want to start, Eric? Yeah, yeah so I, I think that uh, trends regarding payments, there's... People are trying to, I think there's kind of been like a comeback of people trying to use Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a means of payment, right? During the uh, bull market of 2017, a lot of people were speculating and buying and trying to hold Bitcoin. Uh, and then it was like, I don't want to spend my Bitcoin. I don't, you know, I don't want to spend it because what if it goes up? What if it keeps going up? It's like, I don't want to be that pizza guy that bought the two pizzas for 10,000 BTC you know, back in, in, what was it, like 2000? Most expensive pizzas ever. Yeah, and, and right, so people don't want to do that again, or no one wants to be that. So there was like a lot of hesitation to spend their, your Bitcoin, but I think like after the bear market, and now it's like, all right, we have to like build things and, and show like, all right, wh what is this all about? I think people are much more now, how do I spend it? Where can I spend it? Um, there's services now that help you spend your Bitcoin online, that give you Bitcoin back when you make purchases. There's more payment processors and POS systems that integrate Bitcoin so you can use Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies at stores. Um, when we got to, when I first got to Toronto, like uh, yesterday, we got off the bus and immediately right in front of me, there was a drugstore that had a giant sign that said Bitcoin ATM 
on it. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and I'm like, I gotta I, go I, stand there and take a picture. Yeah, right? and, and not just Bitcoin, but it, it flashed, it changes. It was like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, Ethereum. And I'm like, wow, like I just that's got off cool. the bus. It's all this, this, it's happening. Like people want it. Uh, yeah, I, I think definitely like the, the whole uh, market affects a lot uh, the, the kind of usability of cryptocurrencies. And I mean, when we had the, the uh, huge uh, bull, bull run, what basically happened as, as people were holding, I mean, there's, uh, there's not much actual usage. And, and what now we are seeing basically that people are building cool stuff and, and we have interesting projects like stablecoin projects that we have kind of a way to have a temporary... Uh, stable value on, on the um, on the blockchain until actually the uh, the cryptocurrencies become more stable as people are using them. You know, uh, I, I think um, uh, the way it might go now is is that we have we will see more payment processors where you can actually pay with stable coins. Merchants accepting stable coins, and I think the early adopters on, on this whole like uh, paying with stable coins might be actually like cryptocurrency startups and and. Uh, places where it's difficult to accept uh, car transactions. You know, I mean, if you buy, for example, uh, I don't know, for example, if you buy, buy weed, uh, this is a good example. I mean, it, just as an example, uh, you can't use like basically cards, so you use cash. There might be like uh, early adopters, for example, to use uh, stable coins as a way to, to, to pay. And I, I think other innovations as well. I mean, why not? Uh, basically, we could get like salaries uh, each hour or each second, for example, we, with the blockchain. We can actually do that uh, without like high transaction costs. That's very interesting stuff. Or recurring payments, like more uh, uh, quicker periods and intervals than we have uh, these days with with uh, direct debits, for example. Yeah. Uh in seconds or, or it is this quite exciting I think <laughs> uh, actually you know uh, I think for Bumo we have uh, some experience you know talking with banks and uh, small business uh, I believe besides what you said there's some training in the B2B layer as well because you know for some small business some banks don't trust them because their lack of repayment ability. And also, like the payment date, you, you just mentioned the interval is very long, right? It will take around maybe three months or six months to get the payment from large buyers. So I can see there's some training to do this kind of, you know, uh, payment for small business to help them to get access to the financial services, mm -hmm. and also at a low cost, at an even faster approach. So, yeah. That's a really interesting use case. Um, a friend of mine actually runs a business that he s buys and sells materials to aircraft carriers, and they basically have uh, all of these chemicals and supplies that they need in order to maintain their airplanes. But every country he does business in, he needs a letter of credit. And it takes about three weeks for him to work with the in-country bank to be authorized to do business with that customer. And it is expensive. It is bureaucratic. It, and it slows down business. And so there's some very interesting use cases I see around payments related to escrow. Like, I will pay you pending receipt of said goods, right? Once they arrive, then the money's just released automatically. And it feels to me like blockchain would be just really, really elegant um, in solving that problem. Um, so speaking about you know new and innovative financial products, what do you th what do you think of some of the you know new things that are possible with blockchain that simply were not are, are not an option today, right? That that blockchain can bring to bear. I, I think that uh, the 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 stuff that you guys were saying about like instantaneous streaming payments, um, that in itself is really interesting because it's cost efficient now to pay, um, you know, by the minute now uh, as opposed to before. Be like that, that upends the whole subscription model industry, which is what every major company is like going towards now. This is already like the next thing that comes after subscription models. Like people think that they save money by having a Spotify subscription that you know has all these songs, you know, for a flat rate of eleven dollars a month. But and 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 they bring it up like every year. But it actually ends up being cheaper for the majority of people if you paid like a fraction of a penny per every song listened. 
Uh, and it, by by doing using like a blockchain based solution where you load up your balance and it just instantly pays like continuous payments over time and then when it when it runs out then it stops the service um, people would save money and it's it, it opens up the market in a way that that wasn't possible before when you just charge like a flat rate subscription fees so I think that that's one of the most interesting like new things that you can do. Uh, same thing for like salaries, like paying more instantly with uh, people's you know salaries. How about them royalty payments for copyrighted material? So yeah. anybody see a movie and all the credits that roll on the screen, everybody gets paid. Your twenty dollar ticket gets sliced and diced up according to some percentage of every person that flies by on that screen when you watch the credits. Right, and like all the you can't like divide a penny so it's like it's it's really difficult for some of these like fractional like to get it down to to the exact amount that the person is owed but on the blockchain right you could have a smart contract that is just put into the code and so instead of having like a guy who has to like sit there and like go through make sure everyone gets paid you just put it in the code to like distribute the payments out to each each individual person yeah that's right uh, yeah, the interesting stuff, for example, with, with uh, decentralized finance uh, today, for example, is that uh, most of the, or probably like all of the decentralized finance applications, they kind of mirror what has been done in uh, traditional finance. And I, I think like a uh, uh, very good example is is the uh, Ma MakerDAO's uh, DAI stablecoin. I mean, it's it's practically a digital form of where uh, people used to put basically uh, gold into the bank and get the notes of the gold position and basically trade those notes uh, back and forth. So I, I think like stuff that uh, is in DeFi and will be there, I, I think it will be kind of like the very same that we have in traditional finance. Uh, it's it's very, very difficult to create something completely new because you should be able to create it in, in traditional finance. But what of what is the kind of like innovation here is is the um, efficiency. So for example, the recurring payments or or like uh, uh, tokenization and, and going to the fractions and distributing profits in, in a very uh, immutable way. It's kind of like providing more security and, and efficiency. So what we're actually doing uh, with this new kind of like decentralized world, we can do things more efficiently at, at least at with s some applications use cases at some point uh, and that's why we haven't done it for example in traditional finance but economics works in this way that uh, what what's uh, allowed in economics it doesn't look like whether it's decentralized or, or centralized eventually it's, it's finance and I think it's just a world where we can make things economic and for example provide bigger liquidity pools uh, have for example uh, finance which is basically global instead of like re regional but everything's up to also regulation so we we do have uh, limitations and we we kind of i mean work without regulation though i would actually love to see the average individual be able to participate in an ipo like an initial tokenized offering like we have the icos today but if you think about Uber's IPO, if any one of us in the audience wanted to participate in it, we weren't able to because it's all locked out, right? There's that accessibility isn't there, and I'm, I'm really optimistic that blockchain will bring to bear greater accessibility where, you know, in, uh, ordinary individuals like myself and others here can participate in a new company's token offering, right, instead of a traditional IPO. That's why we have DeFi to, to basically democratize the whole thing. That's right. Uh, I think the innovative I can see uh, uh, come from several aspects. Uh, like, uh, you know, um, not, it's not only the traditional assets can be, you know, tokenized. Uh, assets with certain value, uh, if they can apply to some, you know, uh, uh, how to say social, uh, social e-commerce or uh, social marketing ways. It's very easy for them to get tokenized and to you know publish to the to the social network can get circulation. So this uh, we are seeing some some uh, or you know like der derivatives assess tokenization in this DeFi uh, area. Yeah, I also think I think that a lot of the innovation is going to come in uh, crypto economics, right? So if you think about like what cryptocurrency did for the field of economics, it just took what was capable and just 
exponentially increased our our horizons for what we can do. Like you can make a cryptocurrency that mints uh, a million more of itself every other Thursday. And it's like, what are what are the economic effects of that? It's like we don't know because we've never like needed to study that because our traditional finance, like we've never been able to make something like that. So that's a whole new field of exploration and seeing like what kinds of weird new economic models we can come up with. Also, you know, there are some area like uh, the uh, also the in the B two B layer, like there's some invoice, and also for some reinsurance, you know, contract, it can be traded globally. You know, it's not on the, on, in the region, regional market, based on blockchain, based on this uh, trust mechanism. So, also there's another, you know, v very interesting stuff. I mean, one of the things I'd, I'd like to kind of mention here really quickly is for fintech, you really need a secure network that's decentralized. Is that a fair statement to make? I mean, how would you guys feel, you know, deploying on a network that maybe wasn't completely permissionless and decentralized? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it needs to be very secure. And, um, you know, I've gotten asked the question a lot. Uh, why do you need a, a blockchain? Can't you just digitize? Like everything's already being digitized. Like, isn't that enough? Like, can't we just have like a big database that everyone just like writes to and, and talks to each other? Um, and I think like the, the key difference with blockchain is uh, that the it reduces the counterparty risk because you you don't trust the counterparty, and that's the whole idea of it. And that's the whole idea of like accounting. And people have called blockchain uh, triple entry accounting. Right. So like double entry accounting, going from single entry accounting to double entry accounting is kind of what enabled like modern commerce to exist the way that it does and for businesses to grow huge because you're able to track your liabilities and your assets. And, and now we have triple entry accounting where you write it, your counterparty writes it, and then like the whole world kind of writes a copy of it. So that's gonna enable like a whole, a whole new field. So I definitely think it's very important and a necessary piece. Yeah, it's actually interesting because like if you think about like FinTech or even like the higher level, uh, for example, banking and banks and researching a blockchain. And basically for me, it's always like hard to digest when my friends at the banks are saying that they're using, for example, permission blockchain, kind of like because it goes against the ideas that uh, I believe in, in, in public blockchain ledger. But I think it's in a one way, if you think about it, it's kind of them to actually prepare themselves or something bigger. If I mean, if they feel more, much more comfortable to, to, to kind of like uh, uh, deploy to a permissioned ledger, I mean, it might not be always the, the kind of use case. And, and if at some point it makes sense to, to and, and kind of like there is enough comfort to go to public uh, blockchain ledger, probably uh, <coughs> there will be advancements from, from banks. Uh, fintechs in general, I, I think like uh, somehow when you are like uh, doing stuff with blockchain, you're like a blockchain startup. And then uh, if you do only like payments, you're pretty much in fintech. I, I'm not sh that familiar what kind of like... Um, uh, what 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 is their position on like is it uh will they use something like like uh, permissioned or permissionless? But there are like protocols like for example Stellar, which allows you to settle transactions globally, and a fintech startup could use that. So I think uh, if there is enough comfort, why not? But uh, I think I, I think now those like who are kind of again not against but kind of like cautious about public ledgers. It's basically. Uh, bigger institutions and they have their reasons and I think it's uh, totally a uh, good thing as well. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you, especially for large enterprises, security is the uh, first important thing to think. And uh, like, you know, in, our, in, in the, our use case in supply chain finance, uh, only trusted party can join this consortium. So it means all this information will be, you know, circulated under control, it's not the public, because some, most of the information uh, is is it bears with privacy and uh, you know business uh, uh, stuff. So it's uh, it's hard for them to go public, but for the you know consortium, it's, it makes them much more comfortable to get on board at the first stage. And then maybe eventually uh, they find the value of this uh, distributed ledger technology and more application will be applied. I hope so. 
So interesting how that question kind of, you know, evolved into the next question I'm going to ask you guys, which is, you know, what are, we've talked a lot about what is, what are the wonderful possibilities with blockchain and, and decentralized finance, but what are the challenges that we have in, in seeing this, you know, brave new world become a reality? Uh, well, I think, yeah, one of the challenges is um, that a lot of companies are very protective of, of data and like, the data that they have and aren't necessarily very open to let's just write all of our data onto the Bitcoin blockchain or like put it you know in a very public chain um, that's why private permission blockchains are taking off and like are really looked at very seriously um, we take the approach of letting people or letting enterprises choose so we have both a public chain and private chain instances um, so an enterprise can choose to set up their permission ledger, set up the rules and the governance structure that they want, like their consortium, have that all you know, figured out, but they can also still plug into the greater public blockchain. Um, and I think that's a key difference because if you just have like your own permission blockchain that's just, just you guys, you're just isolated, that you're kind of missing out on like the greater data economy that a blockchain can enable and the coordination with the rest of the world's finance. Um, so kind of offering, you know, not one extreme or the other extreme, but it's good. The solution is going to be somewhere in between. Like the challenges are that it's it's we, we came up with like an idealized technology, and now we have to think like pragmatically, like what will the what will it actually look like in the future, and like what will people I, well, we we had all these ideas about the internet when it first came out, and it was like there's going to be no ads, no companies, like some you know wrote like a whole declaration of like what the internet was yeah. going to have. And what happened? <laughs> And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, and, and it was like, every, well, everyone's going to be anonymous and private and, and, you know, reality hits. And it's like, these are challenges that we face. And so we should have the, the optimism and the idealism to strive for these things, but also the, the pragmatism and the, uh, like, the, the wit and the, the cleverness to try to make it happen. Yeah, the Internet's come a long way from what DARPA started with, right? Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, you know, let's... Let's talk a little bit about um, what does 2023 look like? Payments have evolved. Where do you guys see DeFi in four to five years from today? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, interesting question because like DeFi for the past three years has evolved a lot. I, I mean, I still remember how painful it was used to applications and, and, and basically the user experience much, much better. Uh, there is more tools to build DeFi as well, at least on Ethereum. And and what actually I see now is that now that there is stable coins as well here, there's so many things that you can build, uh, decentralized applications. I, I think currently, if you think about the DeFi field, there's like 10,000 users. So it's like a, it's a very small demographic, but I, I think it will grow now. Um, to what extent it's pretty interesting because actually when you use decentralized finance applications, you're kind of paying the DeFi price because you're using trustless uh, services. And the thing is like where the use case is, is where you have a lot of uh, different people that you kind of don't trust, but in some financial application, in traditional finance, you actually build the trust. Even if you, let's say we have a bank in, for example, US and a, a uh, or a, uh, uh, let's say, uh, counterparty in US and another counterparty uh, in, 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 for example, in, um, let's say, Finland, where I come from. So if these guys are doing transactions in the beginning, they might not trust each other, right? But at some point when they build the business relationships together, they might gain that trust. So kind of like they don't, they are like, they trust enough that they don't kind of need the trustless environment. So this is kind of like one of my fears in DeFi that we have DeFi applications and then at some point people are comfortable to not pay the DeFi price and just use trust instead, instead, because trust is way, way, way bigger than than trustless. I mean, we're trusting each and every day of different things. So that's that's kind of like my maybe criticism and fear of the DeFi space for the next few years. But I think in in general, because it's a global, uh, open, permissionless financial uh, space, it will definitely grow. But if uh, we have a kind of like a direction where regulation kicks in more and there's like less and less gray space on, on this area and it becomes like depending on jurisdiction and jurisdiction what you should do uh, how you structure your DeFi business then I think it will kind of like go to the point that it doesn't make sense to pay the DeFi price but so far so good so let's hope that's terrific yeah what do you see uh, 
actually, I think uh, stablecoin would be very popular. Uh, first, among financial institutions. I mean, let's see. Uh, maybe it's not J.P. Morgan's coin, but maybe others' coin. But uh, this stablecoin is not only because its price is stable. I think it's as a token, it combines uh, three kind of features altogether. First is the information structure. Second is a clearance, and uh, I, I mean clearing uh, flow, and and the third one is a fiat. That's the traditional, you know, especially especially when you involved into transborder, uh, you know, money transfer. You most banks will need these three uh, very traditional way. First is uh, some information com confirm who is a payer, who is a payee, uh, how much you're going to pay you. And second is a clearing system, all these intermediate, in, intermediate uh, institutions, they will have to you know, calculate how much I pay you, how much I pay you. And then the third stage is the fiat transfer. But with stablecoin, you can combine all these together into one step, pay the stablecoin, is the confirmation of all this process. So it will save cost, it will save time. I don't, I don't see any reasons not using stablecoin in these financial institutions. So I would say, in, in, I hope 2023, a lot of stablecoin could be used. And also, I expect that some large countries in the world can launch their own fiat-based stablecoin. I, I, I hope it's I believe it's a race for, for the you know dominating who gonna be the you know future leader of the payment. <laughs> That's really interesting. You know, I've I've heard cryptocurrency uh, described as uh, money for computers. Right? We live in such a computer-driven age, but we don't have currency that flows into all of the electronic banking system that we actually have. It's quite ironic, actually, that we're still using gold bullion to back, if we're lucky, you're using gold bullion to back your currency or you're using paper money, but everything else is electronic. So it seems like it's right time for cryptocurrency to actually come in and, and meet the need. Um, what do you see this meaning for consumers and end users? How will cryptocurrency um, it's obviously transformed our lives because we're knee deep in, in the technology and, and on the bleeding edge of implementing DeFi and decentralized finance. But what about for the end user that isn't necessarily interacting with it every day? How do you see this shaping their world and, and making a positive change for them? So I think that for the end user, kind of what, um, I, what, I, what I think I, I would like to see and what I think would be kind of good for the space is for blockchain to kind of uh, take a push towards um, becoming more like back-end solutions. Or if you think about consumers, uh, they don't use a product because it has a MySQL database running in the background or like, oh, I, uh, I'm a MySQL conference. Like I'm going to MySQL. I'm a MySQL influencer, right? Like it's it taking... <laughs> they definitely don't care about consensus cool. protocols. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah like it's... it's um, yeah, right. It's like the user, the end user just wants a, a better user experience. And whatever's faster, whatever's better, whatever has more functionality, more features, which blockchain enables. Um, but I think that when you know it's plastered to the to the name of the product or you know in the UI that it's like a a, blo a DAP or a blockchain app or like that, I think it's really good for raising money because investors will love to throw money at it. But I think for the end user, a lot of times it's like scary because it's like oh I don't know, like I don't understand like what this is, but. Um, if it kind of takes a step towards the back end, we can improve these services and make them better for people while the person is still used to just, um, you know, just a better service. Yeah, it, actually, this is a very interesting question because, like, it, it kind of has a dilemma as well because, like, when things go to the back end and basically if, let's say, if we as a user do need to store, like, the private key or manage it because I think that's where, like, one of the bottlenecks kind of like we lose the whole like decentralized uh, f finance aspect or the cryptocurrency aspect where you actually are, are you, you kind of like have money or finance that uh, you don't need middlemen or you, uh, kind of like you don't trust your funds in a or set your funds in a custodial position. So let's say, I mean, if there's, I mean, one of the uh, stuff I heard is basically where there will be service providers w who will hold funds for you 
but then I, I would say it's easier just to remove the whole blockchain thing because kind of like you're uh, a bit of killing it. But I, I guess it's about like choices. I mean, it could work. And if it works in parallel, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, look at look at email, right? Like email was you set up your own server, SMTP server, and you send mail and you have it. But most people just use Gmail now and Gmail can see all your email. Um, and for most people, that seems to be OK. Right? So are we like basically designed to kind of use centralized uh, services or like is it that basically that we don't kind of eventually in the long run don't care about decentralization what do you think about that uh i don't know it seems like we tend towards uh centralization for the convenience of it right? like another scary thing with the decentralization is having that much power ownership over your own funds is scary for people. It's like having cash in your mattress. There's all the insurance questions, right? And like, how do you insure against that? You lose, you lose your keys, you lose that. Um, people trust custodians because they can't focus on keeping my, now I got to keep my private keys. I got to keep that safe. Uh, I have like all of my funds like right here. And I don't know. I don't know. It seems like historically, anytime a new technology comes out, it does tend towards centralization. Totally but see that with the crypto exchanges right now. I mean, just the and mining as well. Yeah, yeah, just just the sheer volume of crypto that is stored on exchanges versus in private wallets or hardware wallets, I think speaks for itself, right? So it's about the benefit of all the uh, customers, right? Yeah, we're just okay. curious as to, you know, what will the end user benefit from, from oh, yeah, blockchain? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think for the DeFi products, we'll uh, offer, you know, mm, more choice for these uh, end users. You know, like ETF or all the borrow and lending stuff based on cryptocurrency, uh, they can add into their portfolio. You know, more choice of uh, investment, <laughs> and uh, also you know, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, easy to access to financial services. Yeah, I think that's the two. Yeah, I think there's some really interesting things around tokenizing products. You know, maybe, you know, you see uh, initiatives like GoFundMe, right, where right now everything goes through GoFundMe, but theoretically, if I wanted to kick off a, a not-for-profit prod project, I could theoretically just kick that off and do a fundraise to support my not-for-profit project via the blockchain, and I could, in a very decentralized way, get investors to come and invest in that. Um, and, you know, those crypto projects are actually really helping the underserved. So I think there's some great work that's being done in, in underbanked nations as well when you talk about the end user. Um, but key management is definitely an issue I think we need to overcome. So I wanted to take a moment to thank these wonderful gentlemen for joining us in this panel today. Um, feel free to reach out to us and ask questions if you'd like. We'll be outside after the, after the session. Thank you.